Hello, everybody. Welcome to the American Dream. Today we have with us Senator Tom McGee. Tom has been in the Senate about 12 years now? 15 years, May 1st. 15 years. Wow. Yeah. Time flies. It goes fast, yes. And you served in the House of Representatives before that. How yeah, long? I did. Uh, almost eight years. Okay. So one of the purposes of this show is to try to uh, show the public what goes on behind the mm -hmm. scenes in government and, and other entities. So tell us how the Senate works, if you don't mind. Well, How many senators are there? Let's make it easy. <laughs> that's a long question. A question yeah, with know. a long answer. I, I, I uh, can narrow it down. There's, uh, there's 40 senators, uh, yeah. and we represent about 165,000 people, and the districts are split evenly uh, across the Commonwealth. Sometimes during the redistricting, it gets um, interesting to fit the districts together and make sure that they're contiguous and, and it makes sense. My district uh, includes uh, all of Lynn, Linfield, Saugus, Marblehead, Swampskit, and Nahant. Uh, and uh, actually when I got elected to the Senate in 2002, Linfield was part of the district, but part of redistricting changed it. So in January of 2003, uh, I no longer represented Linfield and I, Melrose was included in this right. district, uh, two wards in Melrose. So for 10 years I represented Mel Melrose uh, and <clears throat> most of Saugus, not all of Saugus. Okay. It's part of the redistricting that went on after that. Uh, it made sense to in a, in a more cohesive way, make, bring all of Saugus back together and then include Linfield in the, in the Senate district. And that also allowed Melrose to then be, instead of being split between a senator, have all of Melrose represented by one senator. So we, the change was made and I think it was, it was positive because there was always concern that this, the community had smaller sections of it represented by a di uh, someone else in a different district. So that, the, it's interesting as you try and fit the numbers together yeah. in terms of making sure every senator has the same amount or very close to amount of, of uh, population is making sure the districts make sense uh, uh, cohesively. I will not get in there. Gary Mandering. <laughs> Jerry Mandering from Governor Gary from Marblehead. Uh, what do you have for staff? How many staff people do you have? <clears throat> Um, I have uh, five staff, and um, I've been very lucky over the years uh, to have uh, the kind of quality staff that I do have. Uh, um, they do different things. Uh, it's a different than the House uh, because my staff not only does staffs for the constituent work and the local issues, but I have staff that works on my legislation and my committee work. So as chair of the uh, Committee on Transportation, I have staff that actually works on the legislation. So the, all of the legislation, we do the public hearings, they do the research and work with the co-chair on the House. On the House side, the, uh, the House chair has actually House staff that are staff of the committee. So it's separate, it's not his staff, it's committee staff. So they okay. work exclusively on the committee work, whereas in, in my, my, uh, my staff, we work both doing the uh, local uh, work, constituent work and other uh, things that, in, that are part of the district, and then they also need to work on my, um, my, uh, so you, my, 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 on my committees. You chair the Transportation That's Committee. That's correct. Yeah. And your staff assist you in doing that. That's right. And you hold hearings. We People do. can testify for something or against it. That's right. Legislative proposals. And then you take a vote, right? Yes. And then you report it out to the full Senate. That's right. So that's how it works. You, and and right. I think sometimes people don't realize every bill gets a public hearing, right. regardless of the, uh, what people uh, would perceive it as important or, or less important, Frivolous, depending, right. depending on your perspective, obviously. Okay. But we, every bill that's filed, uh, we have, uh, I think, over 7,000 bills were right. filed this year in that range. Thousands of bills were filed. Each bill will have a public hearing. Some of the public hearings will have 20 or 30 bills on. Uh, but the public, anybody in the public has an opportunity to come in and testify and not only testify, but I think just as importantly, reach out to the committee. Uh, you can give uh, written testimony. You can give testimony after the hearing's been held to, uh, for input on what that particular bill may address and the issues of importance uh, to you individually or as, as, a, as a region that you, or a commonwealth. So it's, it's um, and then we do, we vote on it. The committee would vote. Uh, and if it's a House bill, it usually will go to the House of Representatives if it's filed by a member of the House. If it's a Senate bill, it will go to the Senate. And then that bill, once it's favorably out of committee, would then go through the process. If it goes to the Senate, we would at some point act on it. And uh, if we put it out favorably, it would then go to the House, for the full House to then debate it and act on it. And uh, 
uh, if it was the same bill without any differences that would go directly to the governor's desk. If the bills have different pieces of it that are different, the House may have a perspective on a certain piece of legislation, which happens most of the time. And the Senate has a different perspective. We would then have a, either try and work it out, but typically a conference committee would be appointed and three members of the House, three members of the Senate would meet uh, and discuss finding common ground and, and putting a bill out that, uh, you know, address the differences and came to, came to a consensus right. on what would be the right bill to And then pursue. the conference committee makes a recommendation. Correct. We would make a, re we sign the, the, we get a jacket, it's called, uh, which would be an agreement. We would, we would go through it and uh, agree with the language. We would all sign it uh, if we agree. Sometimes, <clears throat> as long as you have um, four members to sign it, it would go, go out favorably. Sometimes you usually have, many times it's unanimous, sometimes it's not unanimous, but uh, as long as it's four members, then it would go out to the, uh, uh, to the House and Senate to then approve the, the conference committee and then go to the governor's desk for uh, signing. About how many pieces of legislation passed this year? That's a good question. Uh, 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 this Sorry. year, yeah. I, that's a good question. It's a small I, percentage yeah, of the total. Yeah, it's a small percentage of, of total. total. I, yeah, okay. I, it's a good question. I don't have the number, but. Okay, that's uh, all right. What about the Transportation Committee? What do you do? You, do you run the T? The T runs itself? We, we are, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the T runs itself. It's an, it's an entity yeah. within the Department of Transportation. Uh, but we, uh, we have all different legislation that would address the, the governance, the funding, uh, the control board. We, had, we put legislation out that created the control board. So we, we put legislation in that would impact the way that the MBTA runs, what they do, how they get funded. Uh, and then it's run by um, a general manager and the, the MBTA control board, uh, which again we established a couple of years ago. They, uh, they oversee the operation and, and then the general manager of the T would then go to the control board on issues of importance. The control board would then uh, support efforts of change at the MBTA or different decisions they might want to make in terms of governance. And the secretary's involved in that as well. So that's the process of how it runs, but we, we uh, uh, have a number of hearings directly re related to the MBTA. Department of Transportation, the Secretary and others testify frequently in front of the committee. So we work uh, cooperatively, uh, but we also work in ways to uh, address uh, many of the concerns. We did, an, uh, after there was a report came out in 2007, uh, the uh, Transportation Finance Committee report was a, a bipartisan, broad-based uh, uh, commission came together and they put out a report in 2007, which identified <coughs> the, the, the state of transportation at that time. And we still face these challenges. Uh, and they made a whole slew of recommendations, reforms as well as uh, recognizing the need for revenue. And uh, based on that report and, and, and uh, the legislature through the last, through 2009 and into 2013, basically uh, um, approved all of those recommendations that were made for reform, uh, and uh, th those, those recommendations, um, like I said, were, the, the legislature was able to approve those recommendations. One of the major pieces of that was taking the Mass Turnpike Authority, the MBTA, which were separate authorities and ran separately, uh, and merging them into one agency, the Department of Transportation, so, which is created now. So we have the Department of Transportation with under the, and the Turnpike was actually merged into Mass Highway. <coughs> so, those recommendations were to consolidate these agencies into one agency, uh, which we did, and, and uh, because of the, uh, the scale of the operation, we were able to see uh, many um, savings in terms of, of coordinating those resources and, and agencies. Massport still is a separate entity, but they still are, uh, are under the uh, purview with the Secretary of Transportation, sits on the Massport board uh, and, uh, and works with Massport as well. So. It, it, we could go on a long time here, yeah, Jim, I think, in, in discussing the, the different ways the agencies work. But we do, as a legislature and as a committee in particular, work very closely on uh, with the Department of Transportation, with Massport, with the T, we uh, both in the hearing, public hearings, but just as importantly in meetings and in discussions to ensure that we're, we're working to a common goal to bring a 21st century transportation system together. What's the broad general area that the MBTA represents? Well, the interesting thing is, and I think people don't realize this, 70% of the residents of Massachusetts uh, have access to the MBTA. When you think about it, that's 
uh, a big piece of, yeah. of, of the Commonwealth. Uh, that includes commuter rail, so the commuter rail, uh, right. uh, they go to Worcester now, they go out to uh, Fitchburg, uh, Lowell, uh, Newburyport, so they do extend out. Uh, but uh, was, we were talking about, I was talking with this, uh, with some, uh, some transportation people yesterday, and what people don't understand about the T, and the challenges the T face, but more importantly, some of the things that the T can do is, if you look to Chicago or other, Los Angeles, you don't have an, uh, an, a transportation agency like the MBTA that handles all modes of transit. In Chicago, you have a separate subway system, you have a separate commuter rail system, the buses are, are different. In the MBTA, we, we handle all modes of transit. Uh, commuter ferries, uh, commuter rail, buses, uh, subways. Uh, so all of those, heavy rail, light rail, uh, it's all included in one agency. So they, uh, they wanna, they're the only really uh, transportation or transit agency in the country that handles all modes of transportation. Is it fair to say that commuter rail in Massachusetts is a small part of the MBTA? It's a smaller piece of the MBTA, yeah. smaller yeah. piece. It's a growing piece, and I think people feel uh, that we should expand it and make it better, which I totally agree with. Uh, um, it's uh, you know there's a there was a piece in the budget looking to expand uh, uh, the MBTA or commuter rail out to Springfield. Uh, the Worcester expansion has been very successful. So the reality is that the opportunities to connect the state in a real way uh, are a key piece of what commuter rail could be in the future. South Coast Rail is something that people are looking to. North South Rail Link, which would you know in many ways link the north and south areas of. Uh, of, Mass of Boston, north and south, so that you could go clearly through. So commuter rail is a smaller piece, but it's an opportunity to, to grow access for people in other regions of the Commonwealth and grow our economy because the, what people, I think, sometimes lose sight of or don't understand is our economy is keyed by our transportation opportunities. And by making those investments, clearly, we grow our uh, ability to grow our economy. Somerville, Cambridge. Uh, the Boston area, yeah. the Central yeah. Artery Project that was criticized. Yeah. That's the best, in my opinion, um, uh, investment we've made in, in our lifetimes. Because yeah. what it did was it took a, a, a bottleneck in the whole region, which was the Central Artery through Boston, uh, eliminated it opened up the, the, uh, the greenway to really s knitting that part of the community together. But it also led to billions of dollars in investment in the seaport district that wouldn't have happened otherwise and has re really made Boston a world-class city and has continued to be a place that continues to grow our economy for the Commonwealth. So how do you take that investment that's really been a, a huge success and look to places like Lynn and Worcester and the South Coast and Springfield to allow them to access the economic development so, investments that have happened because of that public investment. So let's go there. Some, some have suggested that the commuter rail from Boston to Lynn could be, it's, it already exists, could be approved upon, it could be an alternative to the blue line. What do you, what do you say about I that? I think that, uh, I wouldn't say that's an alternative to the blue line. I think it could be uh, take the blue line opportunity to Lynn and commuter rail access on the North Shore to another level. Because if you, the, there's two pieces here. What does the community, where does the community get rail get you and how does it access you to areas that are, are, uh, are not available right now? Uh, but also, how do we get to Logan Airport? And how do we, as Logan Airport continues to grow? In fact, this year they've increased uh, uh, their ridership at Logan Airport by already 500,000 riders this year alone. They're anticipating another six to eight to 10 million over the next eight or 10 years. They're struggling to get people in and out of Logan right now. Um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, people uh, work at Logan, thousands of people work at Logan, it employs thousands of people both at the Massport Agency as well as private entities. So how do you access Logan Airport and the region as well as create easy subway access? The Blue Line to Lynn is, is, is a piece of that because if you bring the Blue Line to Lynn with a really vibrant commuter rail system, you can bring people directly to, to Lynn, get them directly right. to Logan Airport and to downtown Boston. And then the, the opportunities for economic development to grow with that access point for the North Shore, bringing it to Lynn and, and I think ultimately, to be honest with you, getting the Blue Line up to South Salem because you could then access Salem State 
to the region, which as, as it continues to grow and, and, uh, and prosper and, 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 and in terms of how people view that as a, as a learning institution. The other discussions have been uh, light rail access from Danvers through Peabody up to Salem. So the Blue Line to Lynn would access pieces of the region directly to Logan as well as economic opportunity that the commuter rail won't access. So the, I, think it's a, I don't think it's one or the other. I think, to be honest with you, it really is that it's a partnership between those two kind of ideas to create the, the, the kind of transportation hub here in Lynn, but more importantly, the access to the North Shore for transit and, and uh, transportation access that would really take our region to another level. I think we've got so much to offer. We're not going to continue to build road expansions into the North Shore, nor do, do we want to. What we really can do is take... Uh, build our commuter rail to another level and then bring rapid transit into the system and look at light rail access through old rail lines that have been deactivated and bring those back to life. We can really create, in my opinion, uh, a regional transit piece that would be dynamic and, uh, and unique. Because if Lynn, uh, if you look at Lynn with commuter rail, uh, subway access, which I believe at some point needs to happen, ferry transportation, which we're continuing to work towards, uh, and bus service, you would have inland a transportation hub for the region with all modes of transit uh, being accept and, uh, accessing us through Lynn and to the North Shore. So I think, I think both of those discussions need to continue to happen. And, uh, you know, the North-South Rail Link is exciting, but the Blue Line to Lynn, more and more I think people are recognizing the, how valuable that would be to the region. And so what will it take to get it to Lynn? Uh, that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, the green line was part of the central artery uh, mitigation, so that, you know, took precedence over many other uh, pieces. But I think uh, recognizing the economic, as I laid out earlier, uh, the economic opportunity that something oh. like that would create, and the access point to Logan, which is an economic engine uh, for the region, uh, looking at it outside the box, I've been uh, proposing, they do it uh, in Europe and Asia, they run commuter tr rail trains and subways on the same rail. The, uh, the gauge is the same. Uh, we're doing positive train control on the North Shore, which is happening this summer. Uh, if you could, and there's areas along, if you could bring the blue line along the same commuter rail tracks into Lynn with a couple of areas where there's actually space to pull the blue line trains off as the commuter rail trains uh, go forward, bring the blue line into Lynn, you could bring down substantially the cost, do it in a way that uh, is, uh, you know, using technology, 21st century technology, you could make sure that it would be safe, efficient, and take advantage of not having to build a complete blue line into Lynn, but use the current resources and accommodate the commuter rail, accommodate the blue line, and really do something that uh, other parts of the world are doing, and we could maybe be a model for, for this country. So I think building... Uh, thinking about it in a way that is doable, uh, and, and then building the business and the, the, the support uh, to really make it a reality. The political support, the business leader support, and regional support, which I think more and more is, is starting to happen. Let's assume for a minute, I'm all in favor of that right. proposal, but, but let's assume that uh, everybody else was. How would, it, how would you do it mechanically, politically? Who, who's got to propose this? The Secretary of Transportation? I think... Uh, there has to be all kinds of studies done, right? Well, well we've, we've done n numerous studies. The, the question is, what is the right um, proposal? Where are you? What's the route coming through, Lynn? And I think uh, over, over the last few years, we've come to an agreement that it probably along the commuter rail line would be the least disruptive for Revere. Uh, they would be supportive of that. I think it's, it's working, and I... Uh, both with the administration, with DOT, working with the congressmen and the U.S. senators from this area. But I think just as importantly, working as a region, working with the, uh, the leaders in the communities that surround Lynn and, and, and the North Shore, and starting to really, in one voice, start to say, we need our, we need as a region an investment that is going to impact us in a way that we can all see the benefits of it. And I don't think that that has happened, although when I was elected to the House, and the blue line, we've talked about the blue line in Lynn for forever. And right. I mean, I could get into the history of what happened uh, no uh, need to. to be able to do that in another yeah. side, because that's an interesting yeah, history. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's the, uh, the blue line is really the old narrow gauge line. Right. But when I first was elected, people north of Lynn were uh, 
had no interest in the blue line. But over time, working with my colleagues, working with the North Shore Chamber, working with others, they've come to really understand the benefits for the region of, of rapid transit to the North Shore. So we really have built a, a much stronger perspective of but why this is important. Now I think we need to take it to another level. And working with the mayor of Revere, and working with the mayor of Salem and Peabody, and really working with leaders in Gloucester, and Newburyport, and Rockport, and, and in the region, both legislators and municipal leaders, to start to say, we need to improve our commuter rail, and we need access to Logan, and we need to make sure that the, our constituents and the people that live on the North Shore get the access that they deserve. And I think if we're able to, with, with you know, me, uh, hopefully uh, support from our local um, newspapers or local media that understand the need, uh, you with our constituents that, that we get the, uh, the constituents that we represent, the businesses in the region that understand the impact, the positive impact this would bring. I really think that, and, and then working with Massport uh, and leaders at the T, so that they can understand that this is more than just hey, let's bring the blue line to one. This but really who makes, is. Who makes the decision? It's, it's, is it it's, the governor? It's uh, it's part of a you know the, it's part of a long term planning process. The Do governor you need can legislative weigh in. approval the, to, the, 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 to build the T? It's uh, well, with this Except new control for the budget. with this new control board and, and what we've created and the in the um, in the reforms I talked about earlier is um, you know creating getting it onto the five year or the the twenty year capital plan and that okay. that means building but again that means building who a does, lot who, of support. Who does that though? That's I mean, through the, the the Department of Transportation. Yeah, okay. But you don't they don't just pick and choose. You know, you need to, one, make the case, uh, and you need to make the case both politically and with facts. Right. So I think it's a two-tiered approach. I think more and more, I know, if, uh, and I want to get into different secretaries, former Secretary of Transportation, who was never really a big fan of the Blue Line, because there's so many other, uh, brought him out right. to Lynn uh, and convinced him, and he's no longer the Secretary of Transportation, he's become a real believer in in what that would mean for the region. So it's getting everybody to understand that. And I think once we get through this green line completion and we're looking for other projects that will be sensible, affordable, and really uh, create something that we're looking to create when we make these investments, that the blue line is a place that people can start to understand is important. Uh, I've talked to a lot of different leaders within the transportation system. They do understand that the blue line would be a, a great uh, asset for for the state, and so I think you're just going to keep pushing the envelope okay. and 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 working that working that through, and, okay. and like I said, working as a region to talk about these investments and what they mean to all of us. Okay, I'm going to go on to a couple sure. of other things. Uh, you mentioned the ferry. What's going on with the ferry? Uh, <clears throat> Last year in the uh, in the state budget, uh, I put an amendment in the Senate side to create a water advisory. Uh, water Transportation Advisory okay, Council. Okay, I was going to ask you about that. Oh, also. So okay, that was, ahead. so that was uh, the House and Senate approved it. We moved it forward. Uh, it was uh, it became law, and uh, so that that council is meeting, and it includes leaders from the region: uh, Quincy, Hingham, Hull, Provincetown, uh, Gloucester, Everett, uh, as well as the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, uh, Steamship Authority, Massport. So there's all of the, these different people are coming together to start to look at a regional opportunity for expanding water transportation. Uh, in the meantime, Boston Harbor now, which was created, used to be the Boston Harbor Islands Association. They merged with another group. They, uh, they are advocating for more access to the Harbor Islands as well as water transportation. They were chosen as an entity to do an RFP, which... Uh, uh, they actually did a RFI and then got an RFP to study uh, and make... Explain the RFP, So an RFP please. is a, a um, request for proposal. So they were asking uh, groups of people to come in with their proposal on looking at a business plan to develop a business plan for the region for water transportation. Mm -hmm. And that region really is from Gloucester to Provincetown. That's the, the region that this re request for proposal would coast. address. The whole region, what you think yeah. about it, which we should be looking at. Right. Uh, and that is, uh, so that's been awarded. So they are actually in the process now of creating a business plan to look at enhancing and expanding water transportation for the region. Lynn is a key piece in this because we are uh, close enough uh, a protected uh, area uh, of water that allows us to get into Boston very easily and quickly. So I'm excited about, one, the opportunity for us to be part of a broader plan. In the meantime, we're, uh, we're working to try and re, re, um, restart what had been a two-year pilot program. 
We're still continuing to work on this. We're hoping to see what m maybe this summer to get at least uh, uh, some service. Next summer, working with the control board, there is a pilot program now which uh, the secretary and the control board is very uh, supportive of us pursuing. We couldn't do it for this summer, but for next summer, uh, to allow us to then run next summer with, with service from Lynn. And we also were awarded through the federal government a four and a half million to get our own boat, which we're hoping within two years, we're in the procurement process, we'll have actually our own boat to do, to work out of Lynn as a ferry operation to Boston. And that would be linked. The reason I talked about the advisory council is you can't just think about <coughs> Lynn as Lynn to Boston. You need to think about it as Salem and Lynn and, and Gloucester and, and then with Wynn coming in, Wynn wants to have access to his casino. The people that are coming to the table now looking for uh, water transportation access, the Boston Chamber of Commerce, big operation, Boston Convention Center, UMass Boston, the Kennedy Libraries we're meeting, I'm going to be meeting with soon to talk about their access point because they don't get the, the uh, people to go there, the, the amount of people that should be going to that great facility yeah, right. because it's really tough to get in there and park and the traffic. If you could get there by water, you would be able to regionally have access points to the Kennedy Library. So it's thinking outside the box in a way that uh, takes advantage of the resource that's right outside our door, really, right. with, um, with gridlock happening and challenges facing our other transportation modes. This is an access point that we need to take uh, full advantage of. Uh, the interesting thing of the Hingham Ferry, which is now fully function after all years of putting it together. They get the best return of any transit mode. 62 cents on the dollar is returned uh, on that ferry. Uh, they have a 90%, 98% on time service, the best uh, on time service of any transit system. It works and the people that ride that ferry service are true believers in that as a transportation option. Uh, so we could take that model and look to make it happen in Lynn to Salem now is making money on theirs. They can't. F they have so many people on weekends in the summer. They, they're looking to getting access to a second boat. So I think the time is right, and I think the opportunity for Lynn to be at the table is is exciting. And I think we will be there. And I think regionally we're going to see uh, with this advisory council and with all of the different pieces coming together uh, over the next few is a really exciting and robust. Uh, developing water transportation system in the region, and Lynn will be right at the center of that. I really believe that. Great. I'm sorry. We're going to have to wrap this okay, up. No problem. Thank you very much for coming. That was on a quick show. half hour, Jim. Yeah, I know. It just goes, <laughs> it goes like, like that. that. And we never got to the budget. Uh, well, we, we'll I, have I, to come back and talk I, some of those other well, things. Well, that's one of the most difficult parts of your job. I know. It's a challenge. Everybody has a needy cause, and uh, there's only so much money there's to go so around, and. Uh, so we could talk about the millionaire tax some other time. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to come back and, set, come yeah. back and again. But thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Good.